Okay, and we're live. Hello, it's Judith Holloway here from Tree Frog Properties, and welcome to the interview. You are in the right place if you're interested in property and want to know more about it and take the all important action. This interview is going to be so valuable to you as you'll learn some of the ins and outs of property flipping, adding value to sell on for a property for a profit. Now, I've seen so many sites on the interwebs that are saying that it's a very lucrative but risky way of making money. And others say sort of similarish things, but with cautionary tales of huge mistakes that can turn into a flop, i.e. losing money for whatever reason. Today, you'll be learning from Saj Hussain, and he's been successfully doing it for a number of years. So I'm really looking forward to speaking with him to find out some real nuggets from him. So welcome, Saj. I am so pleased to have you on this interview. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to formally in, do your, your, your bit. OK, so welcome. So prior to 2007, Saj had spent about 15 years creating an IT company. And despite his MBA in business, he almost lost everything at one point. And rather than accept failure, he found and learned from the best in the industry about investing and he recreated that success. He's also known as the property joint venture expert and has built a multi-million pound property portfolio with over 150 tenants using none of his own money. That's stunning stuff. So Saj loves working directly with vendors and investors to find creative solutions that offer a win-win for all parties, as well as helping other investors achieve their own success through networking events, coaching, mentoring, and training. So, Saj essentially looks for two types of property for his investments. The first are properties that can be converted into professional house share um, that are added to his long-term portfolio. And the second are properties that he can acquire for a good price, add value, and sell on for profit. And it's this second strategy that we are particularly looking at today. And I'm really excited to to interview you, Saj. And I know that before we get started, that there are going to be a number of people who are at sort of either end of the spectrum from sort of, um, you know, people who are flipping properties at the moment to people who are just starting out and, and want to know the best things to do. And they're quite nervous about doing it. So, Welcome, Saj. You are showing up and smiling, so let's get cracking, if that's okay. Hi, Judith. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful introduction there. Yes, delighted to be here with you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. So let's, let's dig deep. Okay, so can you walk us through the process that you went through to get where you are today? And I've only just done a top-level highlight of your journey, and I'm sure there's more to it than that. Yeah. I mean, particularly around the flipping the properties because that's what we focused on yeah i guess uh, as you alluded to earlier my journey started when um, i was at a point in my life where i really need to create some change um, i needed to create some long-term sustainable wealth and that's what got me interested in property so i, I kind of stumbled into learning about property um learning about uh, investing in property and creating the returns and many of the wealthiest and successful people I knew had kind of been investing in property. Um, but the challenge was I didn't have any money. But it was a time where there was lots happening in the industry. There's some really good deals. Just bear with me just one moment. I'm just going to get rid of that noise. Just okay. Well, we are live on Google Hangouts, so anything can happen. So hopefully that just sorted it out. That's the thing with live broadcasts, hey? Anything can happen. Absolutely. So, um, so I guess I was trying to find a way what can be sustainable and um, what what I worked out was a way to build a good income is why working with other people was HMOs and that kind of started moving forward uh, and started building up some income 
But at the same time, I was trying to find a way that how can I start paying down debt? Um, how can I have chunks of cash? So yes, the income from HMOs is fantastic, but you know I, I could do with extra chunks of cash as a second strategy. And that's kind of how uh, flipping came about. Um, when, when I kind of got started at the beginning, uh, when I said at the beginning, it's probably around 2009, 2010, when I kind of really started moving forward with flipping properties. There were lots of great deals around. Um, because there weren't really many buyers, that there was a lot of uh, uncertainty in the marketplace at that time, and it wasn't too difficult to find property. So I guess I was a little bit fortunate that there were lots of good deals around. I just had to analyze and present them to my investors in the right way to partner up with them for them to fund them. That's kind of how it started um, flipping properties for me. Okay, okay, that's that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. So. Although you said you started in 2009 and 10, what important things did you learn along the way? Because I'm sure there were a number of signposts because you wanted this second stream of income. So what were the huge signposts for you? Or not so, not, not so huge signposts? Yeah, I guess one, one of the uh, biggest learnings early on was uh, I was looking for properties where there was some discount and we're buying 20, 25, 30% below market value. And effectively, we, we and I'm sure you've heard the term, you, you make your money when you buy. Yeah. Um, so that's essentially what I was doing. I was locking in the profit at the, at the beginning there. But a big realization was just because you could buy a property cheap, it didn't mean you could sell it for a profit. Yeah. Um, so understanding that just because you had a good deal, it didn't mean it was going to turn into a profit. Um, so you'd refurb, you add value, but actually, is there going to be a buyer at the end of it? So the the kind of a, the light bulb moment for me there was I had to find properties in areas where there's still healthy demand where there's still going to be buyers, um, and that kind of restricted uh, my my focus in terms of where I should be looking and the type of properties I should be looking for. Not necessarily anything that's cheap. Yes, we'll have that because we can make some profit on it. Yeah, that sounds really quite interesting because. That leads me really perfectly almost to the next question. And it's because you talked about changing possibly your area because it, you just mentioned about you might get a good deal, but it might not sell at the end. So it was about changing things to, to get into a high demand area. So the question is, what particular criteria or research do you use to assess this hot area, for want of a better word, um, and the property within that area so that you work out whether it is a good deal because you've just said that you can buy it at the front end but you might not sell it so so you're mitigating the risk so how, how do you do all that I guess um, some of the things that have worked for me over time uh, have been what now I kind of function a more tighter area so you, you tend to know your area but when you're starting you, you don't actually know you know what's going to work in which area and what's not going to work so, so, so to those beginners then such how would you look at an, an area that you're not familiar with and and get that really good research and criteria yes i think the key indicator for me has always been the number of uh, transactions happening in that area how many properties are being bought and sold uh, in that particular uh, area that we're looking at, um, and if it's if the 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 volume is quite high, then it gives an indication that the market is quite active, it's quite buoyant, um, mm -hmm. and you're going to be able to to sell. And then looking at sold prices versus um, kind of historic transactions. So, uh, for instance, you might pick a postcode. You're looking at land registry prices. Um, what are they achieving? Has there been much change in those prices, or are they kind of fairly fairly static? Uh, if they if there's a uh, lots of changes in the prices, i.e. upwards, uh, it could be that the market is generally increasing, or it could be that people are adding value. And if you hone into a, a smaller area, you can see the developments around you. If there's lots of uh, properties being developed, uh, that's a good indication people are spending money in in that area. Versus ones where um, you know you've got a, a car on the front drive being dismantled for parts and you know it's probably not going to be as desirable for somebody to want to kind of move there these are little indicators that I, I kind of look for and what helped me with those at the beginning was estate agents spending time with estate agents um, and if I'm being honest most of my property source direct to vendors so you think what am I doing with estate agents well actually my estate agents relationship starts when they sell the properties for me 
So although I don't really work with estate agents in terms of buying, I do work with them in terms of selling. Um, so I'm talking to them about what works, what's kind of uh, working. And sometimes, um, uh, sometimes people will tell you what they think you want to hear. Yeah. So you have to dig a little bit deeper to see how factual is this information. Sometimes it could be asking uh, probing questions or other times it could be that you compare that information that you've got from one person to somebody else. What's their opinion of what's going on in that specific postcode in that market? How is that working? Uh, is it active? Is it moving? Um, what's causing that drive? Is it a certain school that people want to get to? Is it a development happening in the area? What's causing the kind of drive of activity in that area? And for me, those were those were the kind of those were the kind of uh, key things uh, to work out. Um, where is it going to be able to um, work for me as an exit? Because that was always a concern. How am I going to get out of this? It's easy to get in, but how am I going to get out successfully? Okay. So actually drilling down into the area, whether it's an area that you really know or an area that you're getting to know, that sort of information is vital because I'm assuming that you have more than just one exit. Yes. Properties. Yeah, just, just before I talk about the uh, exit, another tool that I've used uh, to, to help me work out the kind of level of activity uh, is HomeTrack. Um, HomeTrack is a, a great uh, software tool that gives you lots of information, but one piece of information that I find really useful is the, the weeks to sell a property. It gives you an indicator of how many weeks does it typically take to sell a property in that area. And, you know, if it's like 20 weeks or something like that, then for me, that's, well, that's a long time. You know, I might be stuck with this property. And if it's literally eight, 10 weeks, you think that's a reasonable time frame for a property to be to be selling. Um, so I find that as a really useful indicator uh, as well. And, so, you know, if you haven't got access to home track, you can still ask these questions of your agent. Go and speak to all the agents in the area that you're interested in and talk to them about properties that you're looking to uh, buy, explain what you're looking to do. And uh, like I said, just compare notes. You know, may, you may not get the same information from all the different agents and then just... Just apply some logic to that. Does it make sense? Do a sense check on it and say, okay, the general indication is, yes, the market's very active. It's moving very quickly. People are buying because of X, Y, Z. For instance, I sold um, a property just very recently, just a few weeks ago in um, Solly Hill, just south of Birmingham. Um, and we were expecting uh, to, to sell around 200. That was our kind of our initial research was it should be around 200, the exit price. We thought that's okay. And we've, we done our figures on that and we were quite happy with that. When we came to list the property, uh, what I tend to do is I get all the key agents around from that area um, to come and have a look at the property. I don't have any favorites that are the other side of the city that come and have a look. I just look at who are the local agents in that area. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had a number of agents come to look at it and their kind of price range is uh, varied. But the key thing that came from that is there's very little good quality stock and there are lots and lots of buyers out there right now looking for that type of property. So we were quite confident we we're going to be able to sell very quickly. But then it was about actually do we try and push the boat out a little bit and try for edging for a little bit more. So one of the agents I do know quite well, he was saying, well, look, if we increase the price by 10% as an asking price, it's going to be a reasonable kind of um, uh a reasonable thing to do yes it's going to be overpriced but we'll, we'll see how that works and the other thing they were intending to do is to line up all the viewings back to back so for example we we list today uh, but we don't do any viewings for about a week and we line up all those viewings to happen on one day kind of back to back okay. uh, that way that will kind of create the excitement the interest and also kind of the uh, the scarcity and hopefully get some um, interest uh going and um the, the the really uh, the amazing thing was the first person the first couple that viewed the house offered the full asking price at 220 oh, grand over the what we thought was the uh, price and this was a, not anything miraculous that i had done it was just listening to what's going on in the market what's possible what could we do um so that's going through now the survey's being done because the survey is always a nervous part you could you know you can get somebody saying they'll pay more the surveyor comes in down values it but, you know, touch wood, that all went through uh, well and we're near completion now. Um, so it was having the right information to help you understand what the exit is. Mm. Uh, 
and then the other the other thing you just mentioned was uh, alternative exits and yeah. uh, i think that's key to have there have been i've done lots of flips now and i have been a couple of times i've got stuck um where we haven't been able to do our primary exit i.e sell at the um, full price um and on uh, both of those occasions we decided to um refinance and keep the property for that moment in time these were going back a few years now and the market was a bit slower uh, mm. and there was still uncertainty in the market the market's much more active in the last few years i don't think we've had anything recently we've got stuck with they've all sold and generally something won't sell um based on price if you've done the property to a, a good standard and you've done it in a way that will appeal to the local market mm. that will work um and i'll give you an example of what i mean by that so there was a two bedroom house that we uh, purchased last year in um uh Tisley. now the which is south birmingham uh, again the the bathroom was upstairs but I, I knew that that particular market, it was quite acceptable to have the bathroom downstairs oh, okay. uh, behind the um, kitchen because many of the properties are configured in that way. So it's, it's the norm. Although it's it's nice to have the bathroom upstairs, it's actually the norm to have it downstairs. Okay. So the third bedroom was going to add more value than uh, having the bathroom upstairs. So we moved the bathroom back downstairs and created a third bedroom upstairs. Now, many people would do it the other way around. They'd move the bathroom upstairs to lose a bedroom, but yeah. it's just understanding what will work in that local market mm. and making sure you prepare the product that will appeal to the most number of people in that marketplace. Okay, that's that's really fantastic information. And as you've already said, you've got a huge amount of value from just speaking, doing your research first and foremost, and then also speaking with the estate agents because that's given you the up-to-date information of what people are after yeah yes absolutely and because you know as a uh, as an investor as a developer I'm not necessarily aware what my end customer the person who's gonna pay for my product is looking for right now the only kind of conduit I've got for that is the agent so I have to make sure that you know I I'm understanding their needs correctly no, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you for that. You've given a very comprehensive overview of, you know, how to, you know, really drill down into an area and, and take it up to the next level. And in fact, it's interesting because, you know, you were talking about moving a bathroom from upstairs to downstairs because it's what the market wanted. And, and again, <laughs> it brings me really perfectly back onto the next question because again when you are doing this management of a property whether you're moving bathrooms or installing a new one installing extras it's about now well, what are the main strategies that you use that consistently keep the project to time and I think also mo most importantly to budget as well Again, that's where some of the flips can go into flops, can't it? With Absolutely. budget overrunning and all that. It's very easy, I think, in property to have projects that take much longer than expected and cost way more than that was initially expected. It's very easy to do that. Um, and I think one of the challenges around that is there's so many unseen until you, so we could say for instance we're going to we're going to rewire we're going to replumb and we're going to fit some new windows fantastic and then when you get there you rip up the floorboards do the heating, and then you find you've got the 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 floors rotten Can you, uh, hang on a minute because again we've had an interruption hang on So I normally share a joke with you at this point. The thing is, I'm really rubbish at telling jokes. So you know, just just when Judith comes back, just start laughing as though we had we had a really great joke, um, and uh, she'll think I told a joke. Uh, but uh, really, I heard that. Oh, I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work then. <laughs> well, as we say, we've had two interruptions now at different ends. So you know, whatever happens on on live broadcast, it happens on live broadcast. So thank you for bearing with me. That's okay. So going back to your budget yeah, and time, budget. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, I guess at the beginning, when when I started flipping, what I was doing was kind of project managing everything myself. I was obsessive about being in control of everything, um, 
and I was using various different contractors for different items. So, for example, I'd have a different heating engineer, an electrician, um, and um, somebody to fit the windows rather than one contractor doing the whole job and taking responsibility for the whole thing. Uh, then I'd be running around trying to source materials and save money that way as well. Now, some of it was driven by I'd save money. And some of it was driven by I'll be in control of what's going to happen because ultimately I have to answer to my joint venture partners. I'm using their money in these projects. I've got to make sure I deliver. But very quickly, within two or three projects, I realized that actually all I was doing was running around, ferrying material around for, for the builders. Um, and the amount of time I was wasting trying to keep on top of the project, I, I wasn't really achieving anything. Um, and then when I moved to having a single contractor be responsible for the whole project, that's when there was more control of the outcome for me. Okay. It's not the only way to do it, but this is what's worked for me. Um, so the one contractor responsible in terms of when they start, when they finish, what the outcome needs to uh, look like, um, and any unforeseen, how do we deal with those, uh, some contingency plans in there, and really good communication. Um, with the uh, with the builder so effectively the builder then is my project manager so I know rather than me trying to save the pennies and cut every corner uh, in terms of costs um, I'll pay a little bit more but actually what I'm doing is buying certainty yeah. what I'm doing is ensuring that this is going to work out the way I want so for instance are we going to take the chimney press out all the way and it's going to cost a couple of grand for argument's sake and um, when they start doing that they find there's other problems unless it's a major problem that builder knows he needs to now deal with it within that cost so it gives me the certainty i know that's done and then at the beginning what i was doing when i was using different contractors i'd get a ballpark indication like for example it's going to cost me three grand to rewire a little house it's going to cost me two and a half grand for a central heating system it's going to cost me you know three grand for windows and doors I, I started using ballpark figures like that as a way of being able to cost a property. So I'd walk into a property, I'd kind of look around, I'd kind of work out in my head, yeah, that's 15, 18 grand this is going to cost. I need to add buying and selling costs because people forget about that. You've got your buying costs, your selling costs, your holding costs, council tax, mortgage payments, all these things you have to do. A big chunk of cash needs to be allocated for that. Um, and then working out uh, some contingencies, something else might come up. Uh, and then that's my kind of ballpark. So um, if I was doing a simple uh, a simple little three-bedroom house now, as I say, the way I'd look at it is um, if we're doing a, a, you know, a, a really nice job, um, we're spending, say, 25 grand on a major refurb uh, on the house, um, I need to have a bit of contingency of five grand as well, and I've got kind of holding costs uh, as well, buying and selling costs uh, involved. So there needs to be a reasonable profit over and above that. So that way, I'm not spending hours analyzing figures and numbers. I can just walk around a property and I say, yeah, pretty much we need to do most of the work. It's going to be about this much. And if it comes off, then I can get into the detail um, of it rather than trying to analyze everything uh, at the beginning. But that comes with, with time and experience. At the beginning, I certainly wouldn't recommend kind of just walking around and sort of hands in your pocket thinking, yeah, we could we could do this for 20 grand because you need to kind of substantiate how that's going to happen. You might have missed something really obvious. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, it's happened to me as well, even with experience, I've missed something. And the builders walked in, so what about this? I said, what about what? I said, oh, I, I didn't see that. I missed that when I was walking around looking at the property. And, and I say this uh, sometimes to people that, you know, our buying decisions are based really on us walking around the property for about 15 minutes yeah. whether, whether i'm buying or whether i'm selling to somebody else and they're buying um so for that that example i just gave earlier of the house selling for two hundred and twenty thousand, they must have spent what 10 minutes in the house and decided to spend quarter million pounds almost yeah so you, um, when we're buying property, we do the same kind of thing. We're kind of walking around and we say, yeah, we'll kind of buy this. You're not spending days there or anything like that. It's literally minutes you're spending in that property. Then you're relying on other experts, your builders, your surveyors, to go and make sure that you haven't missed anything. Um, so at the beginning, kind of having good figures from other people and kind of getting a gauge. So if you've got an electrician you're working with, say, look, you know, this is what we're looking to do as a, uh, as a rewire. What we're looking at ballpark on that, what would that include? Would you do anything differently? Would you recommend I do anything differently? Can I take that as a standard price if I'm looking at another house and say it would be roughly the same or is it going to be massively different? Yeah. And that way you start building up a little picture of roughly how much it costs to do these, uh, do these things. Um, and there'll be lots of little things you'll miss so you definitely need contingency. Um, 
so that that's kind of budget wise how i try to kind of keep it on track by kind of getting the contractors to commit to what it's going to be and uh time wise again contractors time wise always slips a little bit i have to be honest even with the experience it's very difficult for for kind of things to come out exactly as they do so um, we're doing a big refurb at the moment in North Birmingham for uh, a HMO. Um, and we, we think uh, about 10 to 12 weeks. But realistically, I had a couple of weeks on more because I know it's, it's probably going to overrun a little bit. So then I'm, in my mind, I'm working out another couple of weeks on that. Okay. And again, when you're doing something like that, it's about um, adding in the holding costs, as you say, because another couple of weeks has an impact on your bottom line, doesn't yes. it? Absolutely, yes. and one of the most frustrating things at the beginning was when I was getting good at getting these done and templating and rolling them out. I said, right, I can get this, I can get it converted for this much, I can get it finished, I can get it on the market, then I'm twiddling my thumbs. The rest of it is beyond my control. How long the buyer takes, are they getting their paperwork done correctly? And I've had a number of times, um, six, eight weeks in and the buyer falls out of bed. And then we're back to square one and we have to start again. Yeah. But it's massively impacted me in terms of holding costs Plus also, uh, it could be you miss that window of uh, peak activity in the market. Uh, so for example, kind of um, spring, summer is kind of clearly the best time to sell. Um, and if I'm about to go to the market in December, that's probably not going to be the best time to try and sell a property. Mm, absolutely. Thank you for that. You've, you've given some really amazing tips that are very simple to do but yet highly effective, so thank you. And that brings us on to, um, because you talked about adding value, so the next question is, what are the magic ingredients that work in flipping properties you might have come across um, th that work in the properties no matter where they are? Because you've talked about having properties um, in different areas around the West Midlands, so are there any magic ingredients that you've found that work? Um, I think with the earlier journey, it was really about, uh, in the early days, buying properties for a discount because then what we were able to do is um, improve the condition of the property sell. We'll make a little bit of money on the value that we've added and we'll make uh, a little bit of money, sorry, I'm turning that off, and a little bit of money we would make on the, uh, the discount effectively we banked at the beginning. Mm. But with the market being as active as it is right now, the the difficulty is um, we can't buy properties 25% BNB in Birmingham. It's just not happening. Um, there's just too many buyers versus not enough stock. So how do we deal with that? Well, actually, my view is what we do now is we look for properties where we can add value. And the classic one for me is where can we create a fourth bedroom? So we take a three bedroom house in a nice area where there's other properties on that street with a high ceiling price. Uh, so that means if we add a fourth bedroom, we'll, we'll kind of do that. Uh, we, you know, we'd be able to achieve uh, a higher price. So effectively, the value has been added um, rather than relying just on the discount. So that, that's kind of the first, if you like, the, the magic agreement uh, in, uh, the ingredient. Where can the value be added? And for me, the... I tend to have a, a very simple approach to these things is, um, uh, you know, it's, it is magnolia walls, whether you like it or not. Magnolia walls, all the woodwork is uh, gloss white and we have a really nice modern kitchens and modern bathroom. That's the focus for me um, because I think they're the, they're the two things that influence the buying uh, decision. Mm. Um, other little things that I like to do that I think add value is if you can open up space. Um, so, for example, if, you, if you've got enough room at the back of a house where you can um, uh, open a kitchen diner up, uh, for instance, um, and uh, if you can create an ensuite somewhere in a, in a house, um, that I think uh, these, these things don't necessarily make it more valuable, but they certainly make it more sellable. And if they don't cost too much more to do, like an ensuite for me, I'd budget two to three thousand pounds, depending on where it is in the house and how we're going to create it, you know. But if it means I'm going to push the ceiling price and sell it quickly, then that's great. Particularly if most of the other houses don't have ensuites, because a lot of the properties that we work on, are, you know, in Birmingham were built a hundred years ago. Mm. They were built for a different market, so we've got to take that property and make it appeal to today's consumer. 
Absolutely. And it, it's all about the perception, isn't it, at the end of the day, of you know how you deliver the property across to these potential people that are in there for 10, maybe 20 minutes. And yeah. hope that what you deliver is top class and it's their perception. They have to walk through that door and fall in love with it within a few minutes. That's yeah. what your focus should be. So if I was to walk in through this front door, what is it about this property that's going to make me think, wow, I, I'd just love to live here? Mm. Oh, absolutely. If you do that, then people buy with, uh, uh, with emotion and from their heart rather than from logic. Okay. No, that's, that makes absolute perfect sense because sometimes when you walk in a house, you get a feeling about them and that feeling plays quite heavily into, into you and the judgment that you make and whether you buy it or not. So it makes perfect sense. Thank you for that. Now, what I'd like to do is, um, is the last question and then go on to a short tip, if I may. So right. the last question then is, what's the one thing, if you had to think back of all the things that you've done in terms of flipping properties, what is the one thing that you feel that's really helped you build your flipping business? And I mean that in the nicest possible way. <laughs> um, I think for me, it has to be uh, the standardization of the finish. And what I mean by that is if you walked into any of the properties that I've sold, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference between most of them because they all look the same. Okay. And by having the same huge kitchen tile that we use, the same kitchen units that we use, um, there'll be slight variations of little things, but generally the look is the same across all the properties and what that means is if we for example use a standard tap and if that's not available rather than the slowing the job down the the, the build or the contractor understands what we normally do so he can then be empowered to make the decision to go and find something similar yeah. rather than it kind of causing delays and problems well we, well we can't get this finished because the taps aren't here that you normally have there's a three-week wait that really frustrates me on those kind of things. Well, think, well, we know what we're trying to achieve. Why do we have to wait for that sequel? Why can't we find an alternative? Well, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I suppose also with that, you've got very detailed information about exactly what things that you put in. So you can yes. keep duplicating it. Yeah. yeah. And you, when, you, when you're using the same things time and time again, you know what things work. Um, and there might be something, for example, um, I think there were some uh, kitchen door handles we were using that were always kind of awkward and never kind of looked right. And uh, the builder says, by the time it's finished, it looks fine. But fitting them and the way they're done is really hassle. Should we use these alternative ones? And I said, well, the finish is the same. So, yes, why not? Well, and then, then kind of taking those things on a board and doing that every time, you're kind of uh, almost creating uh, a standard spec for the houses. You just need to make a decision. So, for instance, uh, when we go around the property, the windows look like they're about 10 years old. Is that acceptable? Do we decide to replace them? Are we going to keep them? What budget are we working to on this particular property? It might be as a case of, you know, they're okay. They're acceptable. They're usable. We'll, uh, you know, we'll clean up the hinges and stuff and make sure they're all kind of um, uh, well maintained and we'll stay with the windows. So there's no additional cost for replacing windows, but there's going to be something for uh, just making sure that they're okay. It's just deciding which things we're going to do. Same thing with boilers and um, radiator. Generally speaking, I tend to fit new boilers, even if they're not too old, um, because it creates a great impression for the buyer that they've got less to worry about when they, particularly when you're trying to uh, command a premium price. Oh, absolutely. And if you know, a boiler is an expensive thing to put in, so if that's out of the the door for them, and there's no worry for at least a year because yes. we've got the warranty with it. So absolutely solid tips. Thank you. What I'd like to do now is to come on to your top tips, and it's an either or. And the first thing is, what about your best chill pill that works consistently for you? Because sometimes in property it can be quite stressful. So yeah. are there any things that you would recommend to people to try or Sometimes as well, property, the beast that it is, can be quite um, interesting, let's put it that way. So um, what would be your best motivator that consistently works for you to get you back on track? So it's chill pill or motivator? So uh, I think uh, for me, both things are important. Uh, so for instance, um, in terms of 
it can be really stressful uh, when you're refurbishing property without a doubt it can become very stressful and being able to just take yourself out of the situation uh, for me just a, a little quiet walk and just kind of thinking through what the issues are and what we might need to do without any distractions that makes a, a big difference um, and the other thing is just always remembering why we embark on this journey what's important about this why is success in this area important for us what are the drivers and the motivators for us and if you have strong deep reasons why you want to make this work that will always always pull you through and if if those aren't deep enough then you're more likely to throw the towel in, I believe, partway through and the problems really build up. Yeah, okay, that's, that's absolutely fantastic information and I've got so much out of it. If people really want to connect with you, Saj, where is the best place for them to connect with you? Uh, online, just find me online. I'm on many of the platforms, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. I'm trying to figure out Snapchat at the moment. I'm quite sure <laughs> that one. Um, but yeah, online, I'm, I'm very easy to find. Just send me a, me a message, kind of, um, and what is it that you may need um, help with, and uh, I'll kind of um, see what I can help with. There's kind of three things I do. I I'd say that, you know, either you can come and learn what I do, which is kind of how I do stuff, which is kind of training courses. And a lot of those I do um, uh, with and for Simon Zucci. Um, and then there's um, come and do it with me. That's kind of you partnering on projects by funding projects in the way of joint ventures. And the third thing is you let me do it for you, which uh, what that means is I'm producing the results where uh, I have investors that come into projects and I'm kind of just delivering uh, outcomes with certain certainties. Right. Okay. That's fantastic. Um, that has been hugely, hugely powerful stuff. And I've had a huge number of takeaways and I hope that you know the people watching it live or on the recording have got a number of takeaways as well and I felt throughout the whole interview you just delivered and kept delivering and over delivering which is fantastic because I think for me it's the first thing that really hit home hard it's it's almost about that well it is about that due diligence and being creative in the way that you get the information in the particular area that you would like to either start working in or the area that you're in that you know quite well but you you need to know it from a property perspective and i think the other thing was the fact that you know you're delivering this top class product yet at the same time you're making life easier for yourself by standardizing it so it's much easier so and it's back to the time thing because once you know what you've got to put in the houses then it makes life so much easier. And as you say, you've got that flexibility because if they haven't got one thing, you don't want to hold up the works for six weeks or whatever. So the, the takeaways for me have been huge. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just been brilliant to connect with you and pull out of your head. I know that we probably have only touched the surface of what happens in flipping property and you skidded over again quite quickly but I think it was a very pertinent point about the costs it's not just about the buying costs it's the selling costs it's the holding costs it's the insurance and it's you know it's a number of other things that you've got to put into play as well so thank you once again Satch that was brilliant Thank you so much for the invite. Really appreciate it. Enjoy. I love sharing and helping. So thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Thanks once again and bye-bye. Bye now.